if you think we're going to ask the question, we encourage you to write an addenda about it so that you can answer it for us and we don't have to wonder. So we encourage students to really provide as much information as they feel comfortable and as they would feel comfortable talking about with us in their application. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Thanks for joining me for this, the 579th episode of Mission Straight Talk. Are you applying to law school this cycle? Are you planning ahead to apply to law school next year or later? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's Law School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash law dash quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, take the short quiz at accepted.com slash law dash quiz to obtain your free assessment. Now, for today's interview, I'm delighted to have on Admission Straight Talk for the first time, Dean Catherine Scannell, Vice Dean for Institutional Success at Washington University in St. Louis. Dean Scannell earned her bachelor's degree from Wash U and her JD from the University of Missouri. She practiced law for several years, I think almost 15 years, and then joined Washington University in St. Louis Law School, becoming first Assistant Dean of Career Services and then Associate Dean of Admissions. And today she is the Vice Dean for Institutional Success at the Washington University and St. Louis School of Law. Since 2009, she has also been a lecturer in the law at Wash U. Dean Scannell, or Katie, thank you for joining me for Admission Straight Talk. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. My pleasure. Now, to start, can you just give us an overview of the more distinctive elements of the Wash U's JD program? Yes. So uh, Wash U's program is interesting because we have such a broad, uh, we have so many broad areas of expertise that you can kind of focus on. And we really focus individually with each student to think about their career goals. We start that even before students start law school. So this summer, we're working with the class that will be coming in in the fall to help educate them on the possibilities, what they can do with their law degree, and um, and just let them hit the ground running. So I think that's unique, how we start early. And then we have a lot of very individualized opportunities at WashU Law in the educational experience and to support their long-term career goals. Because most students are coming to law school to, practice law, right? Hey, so that's the best, we, that's the best that's, reason. <laughs> <laughs> so we want, we want to help them understand, you know, what all the paths are and, and that can help shape the classes, the courses they take here. We do a lot of interdisciplinary work that is interesting, like our Cordell Institute in law and medicine. And so we collaborate with our highly ranked medical school here to think about policy, privacy, and data issues. Uh, and so, so things like that, we, we've really dug in that provide interesting experiences for our students and educational opportunities. Wonderful. I'm, I'm actually very impressed that you started out with the idea of career services before they even start. Mm-hmm. I haven't gotten that answer from any law school admissions dean, I don't think, I don't remember certainly. And I think I would have remembered because I'm a big believer in graduate school in general being a means to an end. Well, that yes. implies you have to have some idea of what end you want. And law is an incredibly broad field. So I, I think it's fantastic that you provide that guidance even before somebody steps steps foot on campus. That has been a very unique and very important part of our uh, mission in the Career Center. And so even, and, and I should say in the admissions office, even when we're talking with students about why law school, they may not know exactly why law school at that point. Some of them know more than others, and we kind of get the full spectrum. But we start to talk with them about the things that can open doors in their careers. And and we do 
recruit a large contingent of first generation students. And those students, I was a first generation college student. And so I, from a personal standpoint, I know that it's really hard when you don't know what you don't know. And, uh, and so I was also, <laughs> you were also a first generation college student. Sure. sure. So you know how important it is. And that's why we have our career center has given our has helped educate our admissions office on some questions to ask and things to talk about even early in that admission cycle. And even with students who may not end up at Wash U, but hopefully we're we're helping educate them in the whole process. Sounds good. Now you mentioned the breadth of offerings at Wash U, and that was something that struck me when I was preparing for our call. And I also noticed that you have three certificate programs, one in public interest law, one in business and corporate law, and one in international and comparative law. Can you discuss those programs for a second? Sure. Uh, our students, we do try to bring in uh, students with a wide range of interests. And like I said, they often change their minds once they're here, and that's totally fine. But we do like to bring in students with a very varying backgrounds and varying goals. And we think that adds to the educational experience, really elevates the educational experience, those different perspectives. So we give the opportunity for students, as you mentioned, J JD is very broad. You can do so many things with the JD. And so we do give the opportunity for students who know they want to get some extra coursework and specialize in those areas to do that during their JD programs. So they'll have a number of classes that they have to take that are designated in those different bucket areas to obtain those certificates. We also have LLM programs that our students mm. can obtain, and some of them you can obtain in the three years. You can get a joint really? JD LLM. Okay. Tax is one of those. Yeah. You can get a joint JD tax LLM. Our negotiation, we have an LLM with a concentration in negotiation and dispute resolution, and that one you can also do in, in that three years. All right. I'm in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, so I'm on the coast. The other coast. Mm -hmm. um, how does Wash U's location in St. Louis affect the learning experience and job opportunities? Obviously, you're very career focused mm -hmm. of its graduates. I mean, you know, I normally fly over St. Louis. Uh, <laughs> can can Wash U law grads go to the coasts? Absolutely. Okay. Most of our students end up outside. Of, so we have, we're a very national school. Our students typically summers and post-grad go to over 30 states and several countries. Okay. And so we have, our students are going everywhere. You know, it fluctuates year to year what our second largest placement will be. It might be New York. It might be DC. It might be uh, Chicago. Chicago. Chicago's bit big sometimes. I mean, they're all pretty big and, and it fluctuates each year. Uh, it's exciting. We, so you're one of our, you know, you're one of our challenges, right? We, um, <laughs> that was tongue in cheek, by the way. <laughs> no, no, I know. <laughs> really, though, when uh, students are thinking about coming to Wash U Law, we like to get them here so that they can see the campus and see the benefits of St. Louis as the place to go to law school and where it can take you. Because uh, even during the three years, the six semesters, many of our students will do the externship in DC, which has been around for, I think almost 50 years now. And the externship in New York, we have, I mentioned being individualized earlier, and this is part of that. We have a uh, semester in practice program. So if there's an organization doing the exact type of work that'll help prepare you for your postgraduate work, that can be anywhere in the world for really? a whole semester. Wow. And, uh, and so we have a lot of states and countries represented in our JD class. And then, then we find that a lot of those individuals you know, do go to locations, not necessarily where they were from, but go to locations uh, outside of St. Louis after. Although I have to say, our people from the coast sometimes get to St. Louis and think, wow, quality of life here is great. And, uh, 
And sometimes our Midwesterners leave and go to the coast and our, our coast people come and, and decide to stay. So it's, it's human nature, human nature. Yes. Right? yes. You know, I have some kids who've um, gone to smaller places than Los Angeles and they're very happy where they are because of the quality of life. It's uh, yes. just a reality. Yes. Yes. How has Wash U responding to the growth of AI and its impact on the legal world? Um, that is fast, right? No, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, exploded. Just exploding. I mentioned our Cordell Institute earlier, and that's certainly a space where we're looking at privacy issues and data issues, policy um, as related to healthcare. So that is an incredibly interesting center for us. And then we have some faculty like Professor Pauline Kim. Uh, does work in looking at algorithms and AI and in the labor and employment space primarily. A number of our faculty are using big data in their scholarship as well. So, so we are certainly looking from a, a legal scholarship perspective. A number of our faculty are diving into that space. From you may have been asking from a student perspective. I was thinking more like, you know, you, lawyers if they wanted to do research. Okay, in the last you know forty years, you had LexisNexis. It definitely mm -hmm. fifty years saved people a lot of time. But you know, with AI coming, it's changing so much. Whether it's writing up briefs, adapting templates that lawyers frequently use, or doing research, saying you know, look at this case, look at that case. Yes. It is, but we don't want to depend on it. So I think we have kind of dug into, not that we're not ignoring it, right. but we don't want to depend on it. And our legal practice and legal research courses are, are very intense and we don't have the students using AI to, to produce that work product. Right now, I think, I mean, you've probably read some of the articles, but um you know, you can really get yourself into some trouble if you're not careful. And yeah. so I think that our approach is a little more on, on that side of things. Yeah. And you're just watching how things develop. Absolutely. And watching what law firms expect. So we do, our career center works very closely with law firms to see what they, what the skill sets that they expect to see in their summer associates and, and new associates. So as law firms utilize different tools more and more, I we bring that back to the law school and, and think about how best to make sure our, our students are prepared. That makes a lot of sense. Let's turn to the application, all right? Mm -hmm. Wash U says that applicants may apply with the GRE, but if they have an LSAT, the LSAT will be used. Does that policy reflect a preference for the LSAT, you know, very bluntly? Uh, not necessarily, but transparently, most of our students have an LSAT. Of course. We have very, it's a small percentage, always a percentage every year that have the GRE instead. A little bit, but not, not dramatically. And, um, and it's not necessarily a preference for the LSAT, but... If we will use all the pieces of data, so if they took the LSAT, we're not going to ignore it. And if, uh, and the ABA, we report the LSAT to the American yeah. Bar Association. So, um, so it's not something that we would just want to pretend like it's not there. It, it gives us another data point. But we do have an interesting program at WashU Law where applicants can ask that their LSAT score be redacted for purposes of the admissions committee. Now, we mm -hmm. obviously have to see it later and have to report it, um, but the admissions committee could admit a student, an applicant, based on everything else in their file is so amazing. And before looking at the LSAT, they may put some parameters on that sometimes, like it can't be below this, or it, it, it just depends on each individual circumstance. But there is an opportunity for applicants if they feel that the LSAT detracts from the rest of their application to ask that their application be reviewed without access to that score. Wow. And that obviously they have to have the GRE then, right? 
Well, they would have they they have to have the LSAT or GRE, but right. we're just saying that the committee wouldn't see it when making the decision about whether to admit. Yeah, I understand. Okay. And what about JD next? Are you considering that at all? We have, we did ask for approval. And so we've been approved to consider JD next candidates and, and we'll consider those. I don't know how many we'll get, but um, we, I I think that approval just, I want to say came through in the last few months. So yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know. That's very new. We've been talking a little bit about academics and we'll continue to talk about academics, but there's experience. Right? There's experiential learning that goes on when somebody has a job or responsibilities or joins mm-hmm. a team or whatever. What kind of experience either during college or full time after college is good preparation for Washington University School of Law? Let's see. A lot of different experiences can be good. So I don't want to discount experiences. Sure. I think having to interact with different types of people is a good experience for WashU Law. We value that. We value non-law experiences on that note. Um, Sometimes students who really had to overcome some particular hardships, you know, can be, those can be great experiences to bring that resilience. I know it's overused resilience, but resilience is important. Law school's hard. And so students who bring that kind of experience, I think, are are very helpful. Uh, Students who are curious, we do look for kind because you can be very passionate about your perspective, but we really want to create a culture of kindness and respect. So we, we look for that in the process. You know, legal experience can be great, not necessary. Okay. Uh, but but there's something you know that if you have if you've worked in a law firm, you have a little bit of context coming into law school, especially if you don't know lawyers, you don't have lawyers <laughs> in your family. Uh, a little bit of that legal experience can provide you some context that I can I think can be a, a benefit. Do you like people with full time work experience post college? We do. So most of our students, I'm sorry, to, I, I should have started there, but most of our students do have uh, some full-time work experience after college before coming to law school. Okay. So that, that is definitely valued. Mm-hmm. What, what addenda does Wash U accept and uh, who should write them? I'm obviously the applicant, but I mean, who needs to write? Who needs is that to write? a trick question? No, that was not a trick question. Might, have not, might not have been worded the best, but. Um. Our prompts are very broad and, and that's intentional. We, we probably fall down a little bit more, maybe even than some other schools on wanting to know more about each of the applicants. So we welcome addenda on any number of topics. It could be experiences that you didn't feel you got to fully describe in your in other parts of your application. It could be something about, you know, why your grades were so low in undergrad or some context to questions that you, if you think we're going to ask the question, we encourage you to write an addenda about it so that you can answer it for us and we don't have to wonder. So we encourage students to really provide as much information as they feel comfortable and as they would feel comfortable talking about with us in their application. Okay, great. Are you planning any changes to the application for next year? You know, the requirements, the essays, addenda, whatever. I don't see any major, we're working on that right now, but uh, (laughs) I don't anticipate any major changes in the application this year. Okay, great. Now, WashU's 1L class had a 173 median LSAT and a 3.95 median GPA. You can't get much higher in either one of those numbers. (laughs) Obviously, the stats are important. But my guess is that you admit people with lower stats and reject people with higher stats. So what makes a difference? Absolutely. It is not a formula. It is a discussion about every candidate. And the committee has such hard decisions to make because so many people who I'm sure could be fantastic at WashU Law don't get an admission. Um, So the thing that can make the difference is maybe a unique experience 
uh, maybe, um, or perspective. You know, it's hard to say any one thing. I mean, we value strong writing. We value professional uh, engagement. We like I mentioned that we look for kindness. We yeah, like thinking ambitious... about the, what you had said earlier. Yeah. Yes. We like ambitious students, but you can be incredibly ambitious and talented and kind and respectful. That's a very important piece for us. So it's kind of trying to, we want students from different geographic locations, different countries. We'll often have about 10 countries represented in the wow. 1L class. And so we're kind of looking for just to balance all of that out and 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 create um, the best mix of students in the 1L classes we can. All right. Now, one of the distinctive aspects of the WashU application process or admissions process, in the law school at least, is the interview. Mm -hmm. Most law schools don't interview. Some do, so it's not unique, but it is a minority. Mm -hmm. Who is invited to interview and what can the interviewee expect? Yes. So who is invited to interview? The committee decides who to invite to interview, and it's typically candidates that they want to find out a little bit more about. And so they do it in waves and it's not everybody at once. And there isn't because we can only interview so many people at once, <laughs> but, sure. Sure. But, but they, um, they hope to get to know the candidate outside of the paper a little bit more. And so all of the interviews at WashU are done by our admissions team. And that's a little bit unique, even for some schools who do interviews, at least that's my understanding. Uh, some schools will have alums do interviews, but the committee does ask us, what did we learn in the interview? What was your impression of this person? And how do you think they would fit in our community and, and things like that? So we do all the interviews so that we can have kind of a consistent feedback for the, for the committee that's valuable in the process. And so, uh, so we do all of the interviews. In the interviews, the uh, applicant should be themselves. I know it's hard not to be nervous, but um, but be yourself. And we know that candidates get nervous, so we take that into account. Be authentic in their answers and relax. Don't, <laughs> yes, yeah. So, although don't be too relaxed. We, right. we had, <laughs> we've had candidates who show up in their, basically their pajamas and we're thinking, hmm, I don't, it doesn't really matter what your LSAT is, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Judgment, a little judgment here, specialism. We have a judgment issue. Uh, I don't think that happens a lot, but, but, you know, you want to be professional. You're coming to a professional school. You are entering uh, this profession where you want to be honest and authentic and um, and professional in your behavior. So, so, you know, be relaxed and don't be overly nervous, but, um, but do, do think about how you're, how, how you will be perceived. Um, and then think about some questions. We are going to give you an opportunity, just like in an interview, to ask us questions. And we want to know that you want to be here. And so, you know, think about some questions ahead of time that that demonstrates that you've done a little bit of research and you want to be here. You don't have to spend hours and hours, but it's pretty easy to find a few few things on our website, typically, that, that you could ask about. I'm sure. So is it possible to get admitted without being interviewed or are all accepted students uh, interviewed? It is possible to get admitted without being interviewed, but we usually, I would say th this is when it's, t it might be possible. If that's, if that applicant has had other types of engagement with us, the committee might not feel that they need to ask them to interview. Got it. Um, so it's not a required piece. And there are many opportunities to engage with our office and we may know you really well already. And then, then that applicant may not be asked to, to, to interview. I understand. Okay. And is it, um, I assume the interviews are, are virtual, 
right? Yes. Like we're talking now. Yes. And, and then the other question I had is the, is the interview based on the application? In other words, is it questions that the admissions committee has about the applicant based on the, the application, the interview has gone through the application or is it more behavioral in general? It's a mix. Uh, and every interview is not exactly the same. Got it. Uh, so some of it's driven by the applicant and by the information in, in, in the application. We always read the application and have questions based on the application before the interview. And then we may have some behavioral questions about biggest failure or, you know, all those. How would you handle ones. X, Y, Z or how have yes. you handled right? Yes, yes. Right. Um, and then we have some time for the applicant to ask us some questions. Right. All right. Thank you. What do you think of, we've discussed AI, you know, in terms of students using AI, what do you think of applicants using chat GPT to assist them in the application process, specifically the writing process? We would prefer they not. Okay. <laughs> writing is such an important part of law school. We do ask on our application, did you use AI and complete in preparing this application? And the applicant can answer, uh, you know, yes. And, and then we ask, how did you use AI? So uh, we have some who answer yes. Most answer no. A lot of say I, I used you know, something like Grammarly. <laughs> we think it's important that we have a, 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 a genuine assessment of the skills and the writing and, and things like that. So, so we would prefer they not or um, minimally use AI. Yes. Okay, okay. I recently had occasion to write something having nothing to do with admissions or accepted. And um, so I just say, you know, please edit this or please, you know, rewrite this or edit this, whatever it was. It came back. I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I just threw it out, went back to what I wrote I, in my own editing. Yes. I find that pretty frequently. So I don't feel like AI is, is there yet. For no, it's not the cat's the meow. Some, some things like for smaller tasks, I found it useful, but just go write something for me or rewrite what I've written. It was, it was awful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Didn't like it at all. Yes. All right. Does WashU consider update letters from applicants who have something significant to tell you after they submit their application and before hearing back from you after the interview or if waitlisted? At what point is that welcome? It is always welcome at WashU. Okay. We okay. have a very fluid back and forth conversation with the applicants um, and encourage them to reach out to us even if they don't have a substantive update on their end, if we we try to put ourselves in their shoes and it's really hard. You know, you hear apply early, apply early, apply early, and then it's like, hurry up and wait, right? right. And, and, <laughs> and, for, and when you're not in the middle of it, it just, I, I you know, looking at it from the applicant's perspective, it can just feel like what's happening over there and why did that person get admitted, but I didn't yet. <laughs> I haven't heard a thing, it's silence. I can hear the crickets. <laughs> I know. So um, we really encourage applicants to reach out anytime, even if it's just like, I just wanna see what's happening and we may not have much to tell them yet, but that's okay. So. Um, I don't want them to call us every day. That might not be good, but, um, but again, judgment. judgment. Yep. Again, judgment. Yes. So, uh, so we do encourage them to reach out with substantive updates and, um, even just to check in it is completely fine. All right. Now this show should air in a few weeks. There may still be, I don't know when you, when you close your wait list, but there might still be some waitlisted applicants. What advice do you have for waitlisted applicants, either currently on the waitlist or perhaps on it next year? Yes. Um, so for applicants who are on the waitlist, again, we encourage them to reach out. We're happy to talk through options. If they have any substantive updates, obviously let us know. One thing I think it's important for waitlist applicants to think about is how long do I want to stay on the waitlist? It's not often, but sometimes there is a very, very late opportunity 
that, you know, someone had personal issues and they had to pull out of the class. And so there could be a very late opportunity. And, and for some applicants, that's just going to create additional stress. And we want to respect uh, what, you know, what they want in this process also. So um, if they want us, they can tell us how long they want to stay on the wait list. And, uh, and in while they are on the wait list, we're happy to speak with them about the other options, you know, if they would like to think about transferring as a 2L, we take a pretty small transfer class typically, but, uh, but it's, it's usually individuals we were very impressed with. We got to know during the process um, the prior year, and uh, and then they decide to transfer. We want we hope everyone ends up at a law school that they love, and they decide they don't want to transfer. But sometimes you know you start somewhere and it's not the right fit for you, and 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 so then we encourage them to reach out to us as early as they are thinking about that. Sounds like great advice. Thank you. Yeah. What about reapplicants? Yes. Advice for reapplicants. <laughs> uh, for reapplicants, we're going to want to see that every cycle is different. And so we know they can't create a whole new application. A lot of things are going to be the same. Um, but what's going to be important is what's happened in the past year since they first applied and how they productively uh, used that year will be important. So you always want to update your application and make it clear um, how you've worked to make your application a little stronger in that, in that year. One of the questions I'm frequently asked, or certainly at a certain point in time I'm asked, is you and the question will be something like along these lines you know i applied i thought my personal statement was really really good i thought my lsat was low i retook my lsat i got a much higher score i really don't want to rewrite my personal statement how would you respond to that i mean you're kind of getting a second for reapplicants you mean for right? reapplicants I'm yes talking, right so we're probably going to look at your application from last year and look at the application from this year. So it's kind of like a waste if you didn't use your personal statement to tell us even more great stuff about you. <laughs> <laughs> How you're new and improved. I mean, you know, it gives you kind of another shot at, you know, this about me. And now I can tell you even more about myself in this context. And so look what I've done the last year. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So Wash U's stated regular decision deadline is January 3rd. Do you accept applications after that date since that's fairly early, I think, in the cycle? And is the deadline staying the same next year? What advice? And let's just stop with that one, okay? Yeah, um, I was trying to figure out, I don't, we definitely accept applications. And so I noted that, and and I'm not sure, did you find that on yeah, on the website. I'm going to go check that I, out. But we I, are if I'll rolling, try and find it again and I'll send you the URL. Thank you. Mistake, so I feel ridiculous having to ask you that. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's a large but, site. <laughs> but um, we really continue to accept applications. We encourage applications early because we have a rolling process. And so uh, so the committee is going to make do, you know, admit some candidates early. And we think it's best if you can be in the mix as early as possible. We even encourage applicants who haven't taken the LSAT or the GRE yet to get their application in and then supplement with those scores mm -hmm. later. Uh, so uh, so we do encourage early, but we don't have a hard and fast. I mean, obviously, once we've set the class, we're not going to take more applications, but um, but we will, you know, we'll accept applications even in into the summer. Um, oh, if, okay. Yeah. Yeah. As long as the class has spaces, you'll be accepting applications. 
And sometimes it's hard to predict, you know, how the class is going to fall out. Um, we say that there aren't so many seats left at this point, right? <laughs> Maybe none. <laughs> but um, but it doesn't hurt to apply. It, you're not looked down on for applying this year if you want to give it a shot. So there's no real downside. And then you can apply again next year if it doesn't work out. All right. All right. What advice do you have for those planning ahead? to apply either this cycle, in other words, fall 2024, or really planning ahead for fall 2025 or later. Maybe they just graduated college and they want to work for a year or two and, mm -hmm. and then apply. Study for whichever test you're going to take. Yeah. It just opens doors. It's like what I say, you know, it open as many doors as you can. So get to know the schools and Talk with lawyers if you can and talk with the schools. We have a lot of opportunities through WashU to learn about careers if you're a prospective law student, to um, learn about the application process, to do workshops, to do, if you have that time, you know, really take advantage of that to make your application the very best it can be. You kind of, you have this extra time to, to start thinking about it. Talk with, I always say talk with lawyers, but do be cautious that some lawyers who have been out as long as I have and are not in higher ed right now, <laughs> have a different perspective on how things work. So <laughs> make sure, you know, listen to everyone, make connections, build your network. Building your network is something that you should always be doing. And you can always learn something from everyone you speak with, even if it is, I never want to do that kind of law. <laughs> that <laughs> That's very valuable, actually. <laughs> it is quite valuable. So the more you do of that... And it's fun to get to know people and and learn something about them. So the more you do that, I think the better position you are coming into law school in many ways. Uh, so so that's that's my advice. And have fun with it, though. Don't make it a a, a chore. Just have fun with it. I think I think it's wonderful advice. What was going through my head though is sometimes when you talk about networking or building a network. There's a certain, I don't know, unpleasantness to it. It, it. It's not that it's a chore. It's like you're, you're almost using people. So how, how can you build a network constructively in, in, a, in a human and kind way? Yes, yes. Uh, as soon as the word network, because it does still come out of my mouth, but I ha I do feel like it has this connotation to it that is yeah, not what I, I, I don't. I haven't, haven't come up with the right word, but there's there's something a little exploitative about it, uh, slimy. It's actually really fun, especially in that period where you're not looking for a job <laughs> um, to get to know people and learn. So we call, we encourage our students to do informational meetings sure. and you're, you don't have an ask. You, and we also encourage students to keep them short. So, you know, and, and I would say this for students, for pre-law also, when you're in that space and you haven't started law school yet, just ask if you can speak with someone for 10 minutes. Everyone is so busy. Have a few great questions and be, you know, don't take more time than that because then they'll want to talk with you next time you call too. And, and it's, you, <laughs> if you authentically are interested in what they do, it doesn't feel feel like you're using them. It, it can be a really great experience for both the attorney and for the individual, the future attorney who's asking the questions. Uh, often attorneys like to talk about themselves and their work. They're usually pretty excited about that. And, and so you can just learn something and Hopefully everyone who's coming to law school likes to learn. So I, I look at it that way and follow up authentically with updates. They, they would thank love yous. to know. And, and thank, thank yous. yous. Yes. And thank yous. And when you decide where to go to law school, let them know. And, and just short emails, keeping them updated. And if you really don't connect with someone, you know, you don't have to pretend 
we'll find that, somebody else. Yes. Yes. Meet people and, and let those, those professional relationships grow organically. Right. Right. I think this is a really good point. And it, uh, I once had somebody on the podcast who'd written a book about coffee chats. It was a yes. Stanford graduate school business alum. And he and another student had written this book and it was, you know, it's like invite somebody out for coffee, invite yes. them out for lunch if they have the time and you're willing to do it. Uh, you know, or you say, ask for a 10 minute call, be appreciative, be kind. Maybe you can help them with something, you know, it doesn't always have to be taking, 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 try and be a, a giving person in the relationship also. Absolutely. And even with coffees, I say, you know, offer to take them to coffee, but also offer to go to their office. That's the easiest. Bring thing them coffee. Them. Bring them the coffee. Um, because even just leaving the office to go meet at a coffee shop can sometimes be a bit of a burden when you're working really hard and trying to bill all those hours or, sure. um, so I try to always be respectful of the request and also provide some information about yourself. I, you know, I encourage students to say, so that you'll have some background about me, I've attached my resume, not because I'm asking you for a job. It's just because I want you to know a little bit about me. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so not have any real ask out of the, out of it other than the 10 minutes. Right. Right. Yeah. Great advice. Thank you so much, Katie. I think we're almost out of time. I want to respect your time and I want to thank you again for, for joining me and sharing your expertise and your insight into Wash U Law School. Where can listeners learn more about Washington University and St. Louis School of Law? So you can email our office and that's one way you can call if you want to be old school about it. We are <laughs> happy to receive a phone call. You can go to our website, which is law. I don't want to get it wrong. It's law.wustl.edu. W-S-T-L, right? W-U-S-T-L. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you can. We have programs on Discord. So we have workshops on Discord. We have live Zoom programs all year long with our career center and with our admissions office. And we have one of our best resources, I think, are our one-on-one -on -one consultations. You don't have to say you want to apply here. You don't have to, You just if you just want help with how to apply to law school or how to learn more about law school, you can do a one-on-one -on -one consultation with one of our admissions ambassadors. They can even look over your personal statement, you know. So they're not in the admissions office, but they're. they're those are current students who have been trained and they, we don't want the people in the admissions office to right. be giving that direct advice because that doesn't seem appropriate. Right. But, um, but they are happy to speak with, uh, prospective law students just about what it means to be in law school. You can just ask any questions uh, and they'll give you their take on what they think is, you know, th from their perspective, what, what their experience has been. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Again, I also want to thank our listeners for joining me uh, for this wonderful interview with Dean Katie Scannell from the University of Washington School of Law. And we're going to include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 579 to the Washington University in St. Louis School of Law website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. Quick reminder, don't miss the law school admissions quiz. Find out if you're really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at exhibit.com slash law dash quiz. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. 